Hi, Evergreen. My name is Corinne, and I'm the Director of Children's Ministry and Family Life. Welcome to this week's virtual worship service, where I'll be leading us through today's worship. I have a few announcements for you. Many of you know that throughout the summer months, we love to make and provide lunches for children in our community who normally receive reduced or free lunches throughout the school year. You also know that at the end of that season, we love to spoil them right before school starts back up. We need your help. We are looking for $25 gift cards to either Target or Walmart, as well as school supplies that we can drop off with their last lunch of the summer and get them ready for the school year. We're hoping to raise $3,000 worth of gift cards, so please pick yours up and bring them by the church by July 23rd. We're also looking for loose leaf paper, colored pencils, pencils, any kind of school supplies that will serve them, whether they end up um, studying at home or at the school. So please help us out as we serve our community. You also may have received an email this week um, with an update regarding our reopening plan. Given everything going on, we've needed to make a few adjustments. So please read that email carefully. Don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns. Okay, I'd like to start us in our call to worship this morning. This message comes from Psalm 100, so receive these ancient words as we begin to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Join us now as we worship. The church has one foundation, is Jesus Christ the Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he sought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet Okay, Evergreen, today is actually my first sermon, which means it's new terrain for me, and it's probably new terrain for our relationship. And one of the reasons I have yet to get on this stage is because I take teaching the Bible very seriously, and I'm very concerned about misrepresenting God in this moment. So in order to quiet that fear, I would actually like to pray scripture over myself today. Now, as I've been teaching the Bible in other areas, there's a certain piece of scripture that I pray over myself before I begin, and that's something I want to invite you into now. 
This is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna read the piece of scripture once now, just so you can get a little familiar with the words. Then I'm gonna open us in prayer and I'll lead into the scripture again. At that point, I ask that you quietly pray that scripture over me. This um, comes directly from Ephesians and I love it because it's something Paul wrote to his own church. And what I love about that is he is a leader asking his congregation for prayer as he continues to lead and to preach. So let me read that for you now. This is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Okay, join me now in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and thank you for all that you've done um, in our lives to bring us here together. We ask that the remainder of this worship service only glorifies you, that this may be your words and not mine. May they flow seamlessly and, um, and bring praise to you. Ephesians 6, verses 19 through 20. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Amen. Okay, so you may or may not know that we have been in a sermon series regarding spiritual disciplines. Now, I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, this sermon series, but it's kind of a fancy word the church uses to talk about practices and habits that Christians partake in in order to get closer to the Holy Spirit. You may have heard things like fruit of the spirit, spiritual gifts, and those things are almost lists in scripture that are evidence seen in us that the Holy Spirit is working. So think of those as an overflow of the Holy Spirit living within us. Love, joy, peace, patience, all of those things. The spiritual disciplines come from the other side. Those are things that we lean into in order to seek God. And it may not surprise you that the more we seek God, the more we lean into the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual fruits and gifts you might see more and more of. They might become more and more evident as you get to know his voice and his character better. So the spiritual disciplines are something that we just pick up on over the course of human history and scripture that the Lord calls us into to come closer to him. And today, we are covering repentance and confession. Now, I have to be honest with you. Um, when I found out my first sermon was on repentance, I was not exactly thrilled. <laughs> and um, I realized the reason I wasn't thrilled is because repentance, the word repent, um, is kind of a touchy subject. And the more I thought about it, it's a touchy subject because we might have difficult experiences with what repentance should look like. And then also, as human beings, we're not that comfortable with admitting how we mess up or what we do wrong. And so repentance and confession, it is a touchy subject. It's uncomfortable to talk about. But the truth is, I think that uncomfortable heart, part of our hearts and minds is actually where God wants us to work today. So as I was reflecting and thinking about um, where we could begin, God actually showed me that I think there might be a spectrum of reactions to or relationships with repentance and confession. Um, and I want to start where my mind went directly, the end of the spectrum that the first thing I thought of when I heard the word repent. And the truth is, repent is a pretty focused word in the English language. It doesn't have multiple meanings. And on top of that, depending on your life experience, it might have a very specific cultural connotation or memory even for you. So where mine starts is um, <laughs> reaction number one, I'm going to call scary repentance. And this is what I mean. Um, I actually started thinking of certain sermons that tend to be delivered in a loud manner and an aggressive manner, and the pinnacle of that message tends to be repent and be saved. Um, a lot of times, though, I realize this approach to repentance might actually be based in fear. The understanding is that if we do not repent, we will not be saved. More so, uh, we will be separated from God for eternity. Now, these messages are derived from scripture. Much of our understanding of the need to repent comes from the time of prophets, when Israel had split into two nations and neither of them were upholding their side of the covenant. 
These prophets were sent to both countries, Israel and Judea, over hundreds of years to warn people to return to the covenant they were taught. Here's the thing. The promised land, the actual land these nations embodied, was a fruit of the covenant relationship God had established with his children. So the warnings of these prophets, what they're saying is, don't uphold the covenant. You lose the protection and the provision of the promised land that is the fruit of what you're supposed to be invested in. Break the covenant, lose the land. Pretty simple. But repentance is also very present in the New Testament. And Christ utters similar warnings. He tells us to repent and turn to God, to repent and to believe, to admit our sins for the kingdom of God is near. You might be recognizing some verses there. Where the promised land was the fruit of the covenant relationship in the Old Testament, the coming eternal kingdom of God on earth is the fruit of the relationship with Christ in the New Testament. But here's the thing. If we overemphasize our side of that covenant, of our ability in that covenant, that's when we get afraid of losing the fruit. That's why I think that a fearful approach to understanding or a a relationship with repentance actually reflects a misunderstanding of the gospel. If we believe that our salvation is only a result of a prayer prayed, we remove the authority of God from his work of salvation. In other words, thinking we can earn our own salvation through repentance makes a two-way promise a one-way street. If you and I are required to do or say something so that God redeems us, the gospel is not based on grace. It's based on human action. And if you and I both know that's not how God works like ever once in the Bible, salvation, redemption, justification, being reunited with God, are all actions of receiving on our part, not earning. Now, repentance is still important. It's how we recognize our sin. It's how we recognize that God is the only God and that Christ is his only son. It is also how we signify our own submission to his authority and will. But our salvation is a state of being given to us by God, a fruit of our relationship, not something we can earn on ourselves. Seeing repentance as some fear-based insurance policy strips God of his own grace. Okay, reaction number two. I call this sad repentance. (laughs) Where scary repentance makes too much of ourselves, sad repentance actually does the same thing. I believe sad repentance doesn't give God his due either. So sad repentance is when we're so aware of our failures and lack that we're sad before the Father. Don't get me wrong. No matter what anyone has told you, you are more than welcome to be a mess in front of God. There are entire books of the Bible dedicated to mourning and weeping and seeking him as our hiding place and our comfort in the most heartbreaking moments. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the moments where we're groveling before the Lord. And there's a difference between confidently asking for forgiveness because of what Christ already did And when you approach the Father as if Jesus died on the cross for everybody but you. Like Easter Sunday happened for everybody but you. Like you can't cover what you've done. Think about how you approach the communion table. When you take communion, you're affirming the most ancient covenant between the creator of the universe and his children. You're taking up the provision only he can provide and letting it wash over you. I don't think Christ died so that we can stay sad and enslaved to our sins. I think Christ died so that you and I can walk in freedom, propelled with the confidence of grace to change. Have you ever seen the Da Vinci Code? Um, Remember, it was a best-selling book like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and they made it into a movie. It wasn't Nicolas Cage. It was the other guy. I don't know who it was. But the opening scene of that movie, there's a priest kneeling before a cross, whipping himself across the back as payment for his sins. He's also trying to get closer to Christ by understanding his experience. This is the mental picture I have for sad repentance. But the truth is that Christ literally took every lash so you don't have to. Sad repentance reflects a disbelief that the act he did on the cross is not sufficient to cover what you and I fail to do today. 
If Christ was standing before us, I don't think it would make us sad. <laughs> and it wouldn't cause shame or a lack of ability to stand firm in confession and look ahead with confidence. There should be a solid foundation of confidence when we repent. Okay, reaction number three, it's a toughie. I call it ambivalent repentance. If you haven't connected with the first two, you might see yourself here. And there's actually two versions. Um, one is that we think that because of what Christ did is so great, we don't need to confess. The other option is, again, we're uncomfortable with understanding the depths in which we've hurt others and hurt God. So we're just not going to think about it. And we might even tell ourselves, lie to ourselves and say, well, God's so big. He's so all-knowing. He already knows what I did. I've already been forgiven. We don't even need to talk about it. I think that scary and sad repentance are actually failures to understand the gospel. But I think ambivalent repentance might be a failure to understand the covenant, to understand the type of relationship God wants. Um, do you know anyone in your life who absolutely refuses to apologize? <laughs> you know when they've done something to you. They know you know when they've done something to you. And the, the tension is thick, and it's an elephant in the room. And at some point, they just shove it under the rug and choose to move on. Do you want to stay in relationship with that person? Most of the time, not. That kind of halts the development of the relationship. It breaks trust, and on some level it says, you are not worth the amount of humility it would take me in order to apologize to you. I think that's the equivalence of ambivalent repentance with God. The truth is that well before Christ was on earth, God sought relationship with his people. That's why humanity is the only thing in the universe made in the image of God. That's why Genesis teaches us that when God created Eden, he walked with Adam and Eve. So imagine your life and your faith as a walk with God just like them. But I also want you to imagine that in your faith, there's a pace. You know, you know when you leave a store or really anywhere, on a trail, it doesn't matter. When you're walking with somebody next to you, you both adjust your stride and your pace so that you're walking together in tempo. And actually, sometimes we'll get to the point where you're walking with the same foot forward as the other person. If we don't think we need to verbalize the specifics of what we're doing wrong in our relationship with God, we're breaking that stride and pace with him. Don't get me wrong, he's God, it's his pace. But the beauty of who he is is that he's designed a pace you can keep up with. And we can feel a difference in our lives when we're out of pace. I never have to preach that. You know exactly what feeling I'm talking about just by that sentence alone. It is in your gut. But the glory of what Christ did is that it gives you the opportunity to return to the pace he set. God wants a relationship with you. And if you think you can get through this life avoiding that he doesn't or avoiding the idea that he does and continuously denying the opportunity to return to pace, I think you have misunderstood the heart of the father. And if you didn't realize the heart of the father until this very moment, that's okay too. Because the truth is we have repentance to jump back in. So I wanna see this in action. We're gonna go back to the beginning and we're gonna look at Genesis 3. This is kind of a popular chapter in the Bible because this is when Adam and Eve eat the fruit and ruin everything. And whenever I hear this story, um, it makes me think of kind of that classic example when a child is throwing a ball inside, even though they've been told not to, they know not to, and they end up breaking a lamp, right? Lamp's a mess on the floor. Adam and Eve, their eyes are open, they realize they're naked and they hide. And so does this child. And then the child hears the parent coming. My dad is very heavy footed. I know exactly when he's home. And I think that's what's happening with Adam and Eve here. But listen to what God says in this moment. He says in verse nine, where are you? Adam admits in this moment that he was afraid and he hid. That's scary repentance. That's ambivalent repentance. 
<laughs> and then this is great. He takes it a step further and he spins it and he blames it on God. He says, actually, the woman you gave me, she did this. When God turns and speaks to Eve, she blames it on the snake. Because God is both merciful and just, neither of them die, but they do receive consequences. However, God also covers them in their lack. He sacrifices one of his own creation and covers them in animal skins. Even in our failed repentance, God makes up the difference. Adam and Eve were covered by the sacrifice of an animal in Eden. In Eden. You and I are covered by the sacrifice of the Son of God on a cross. You don't have to repent out of fear of losing your salvation. God does the covering. You don't have to grovel before the Father for what you've done because he is a God that has already covered you. And even if you spent your entire life avoiding repentance, you are covered. You may or may not have noticed that we did not confess our sins corporately before this moment, and I wanted to wait to do so. So now, I'm going to read a piece of scripture that will act as our corporate confession. Then we're going to move into a time of worship, and I ask that you praise God, that he is a God of covering, but also take the moment to reflect on your relationship with repentance and maybe how he's calling you further. After that, I'll read another piece of scripture that we'll receive as our assurance of pardon, reminding us that we've already been covered and invited back into pace with him. Our prayer of confession comes from the book of Daniel, and um, it's a prayer that Daniel wrote. And this is chapter 9, verses 4 through 10. Remember, he is living um, in exile in the Babylonian Empire and separated from the kingdom of God, just like those prophets warned. Here is his confession. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We've not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, to our princes, and to our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame. Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Please join us in worship. I 
feeble life is more time for me will be no more guide me safely gently o'er to thy kingdom shore to thy shore just a closer walk with me granted Jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be okay Evergreen now receive the assurance of pardon today we'll be using Psalm 32 blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you are up, who are upright in heart. Receive now the benediction. So, Evergreen Church, knowing that by God's grace you are free of your sins, walk in pace with the Trinity. The Father is behind you, Christ has gone before you, and the Holy Spirit is within you. Amen. Like a fire shut up in my bones, I want the world to know you are God. With a passion burning deep within, I want the world to know that you live. Jesus, I'm desperate. to pray every part of me make me new and let your spirit come and move within to fill me once again cause I need more Jesus I'm desperate for you Jesus I'm hungry
Cause Lord, you 